Okay, so thank everybody for coming. Um, this is the Qt Event Loop and Networking and IO API. This is format as a tutorial. I'm just going to go through how and how, why we did some of the things. Um, I'm going to start very easily into what, how Qt does things and then build from there. But just so I know my audience, who here has already used Qt before? OK, that's about 2 thirds of you guys. So you must have seen some of the things there because it's like your first Hello World application does contain some of the things I'm going to present. But I'm going to go through over it, and then we can, um, we can go further a little. Um, so first of all, a little about me. Um, I'm an open source developer. I've been developing open source for 15 years or slightly more. And of those 15 years, the past 13 have been exclusively on C++. I have done a little C here now and then. I dabble with Perl. I do not understand Python. I don't get Ruby at all. Um, but it's mostly C++. And every time I have to program with C, I probably feel like just like you guys, like, why can't I have a destructor? Why do I have to remember to free that variable? And why can't my pointers transfer ownership like I want them to? So yes, C++ is my home of choice. And I've been um, doing that work, especially with Qt itself, for the past decade. I started at Intel at the Open Source Technology Center uh, about a year and a half ago. I started uh, in Europe, and I moved to Portland uh, just six months ago. So for me, this was actually a short trip. Uh, that was easy, uh, just two flights. And then I woke up yesterday in my bed. I was, I was here in the evening. Uh, if I was still living in Europe, that would have been quite a harrowing flight, and it would be completely jet lagged by now. I see Jens, for example, just shaking his hand. He's probably done that. He's coming from Germany. Um, so last year, when I went to meeting C++, uh, that was the other way around. Uh, in the Qt project, I'm, I'm a maintainer, especially of Qt Core. That's what takes most of my time these days. I am also the maintainer of the Qt Dbus module, but frankly, that one doesn't uh, require much of my time. It's just, you know, simple things, uh, simple bug fixes. There's um, an upcoming change. I'll have to do some refactoring, but I haven't got there yet. Uh, interestingly, I'm, I've got an MBA. I've also done some business work before, so I try to understand all the sides of the, how things go. And uh, I'm the person who led the Qt Open, Go Open Governance project, so what created the Qt project, that was my last project before I, uh, I left Nokia. So a little about Qt. Um, Qt 5 is the first major, major version of Qt in seven years. Uh, we had lots of goals, trying to do things. Uh, I'm not going to go into that detail. This is not a presentation about the Qt 5 goals. I'm mostly going to talk about, I'm using Qt 5 in my slides. I'm using some of the new features. I'm, of course, using C++ 11 because it made my life easier. So some of the things I'm talking about only work on Qt 5. But the principles have been there for years. They have been there. Um, some of them from the first thought about Qt. So now we've got a new graphics stack. Um, you might have heard of QML. It's a new language, especially done for UIs. I'm not going to talk about that at all. I'm the maintainer of Qt Core. I'm the guy. Today, somebody was asking me on IRC um, how I would like to, to see uh, an application that shows the traffic, uh, network traffic per application. I said, well, give me TCP dump. That's what I want. I don't want UIs. Right? So I'm not going to at all talk about this. This is not my area. So what we are right now, um, 502 has been re was released last month. 5.1 beta 1 um, slide is light, slightly forward in time. Uh, the release is supposed to be tomorrow. <laughs> if everything goes right, I was at the release meeting this morning. Uh, we were discussing everything. Looks fine. We've got the last installers being created. So uh, 5.1 beta 1 
should be tomorrow. So for my presentation tomorrow, which also has the same slide, I should be correct. So I'm going to go over these topics. The API basics, I guess most of you guys know it, so I'm going to go more or less quickly on it. The event loop, uh, how event loops and threads get together, and then a little about networking and I.O. Uh, just so how we can do this thing, I'm open for questions. Do raise your hand, ask me your questions, please stop me. I've got source code showing up, so if you want me to stop, I will be slower on the slides that have source code, so you can stare at it and try to understand it. If you don't, raise your hand, I'll be happy to explain. If I start to talk too fast because I got excited, raise your hand. Ask me to repeat. I'll try to do that. And I'll try to have a sip of water every now and then. So we, we're OK. And before I go into that, let me just give you a backstory on Qt. Um, Qt was created by these two Norwegian engineers in their PhD thesis. They were studying computer science at the uh, University of Oslo. Or was it in TNU? I don't remember which one. And at one point, one of them was discussing, um, so they had published some papers, they had published some research on how to do things. So the first ideas of how Qt would work, like Q object, Q widget, and exec, which is the event loop, were in those first papers. So if you read the, the, the master thesis, the PhD thesis of Eirik Schambeeng, who is the, uh, the the, the one of the two founders of uh, Trolltech, which created Qt, you're going to see code there that still makes sense to you, and modular one or two things still compiles. Um, last year at Dev Days in Berlin, he came and gave um, a session which was very well attended, and he tried to take source code from Qt 1.0, uh, 0.90, and just show that this thing still runs. Um, of course, the compiler has updated in the meantime, so some of the things needed to update. Uh, he was actually just showing the Easter eggs, some of the things that were still there. Um, and uh, I actually, the presentation is online. If you want, I can give you the link. So the Qt API basics. Um, what we try to do in Qt is that we try to make it Easy to use, very intuitive, uh, needs to be very powerful. We're trying to do lots of things with it. It needs to be cross-platform. So we have what we call the rule of three, which is that any API that makes sense needs to be implemented in three different platforms. It needs to be implemented in what, in the Qt project, we call the reference platforms. That is Linux, Mac, and Windows. And we have one very important um, aspect is that we need to be backwards compatible for years. So if you want to know about how we do backwards compatibility, that's a talk tomorrow. Right. Today, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk more about uh, what I've t said before. So a rule of thumb that we try to talk about is how do you, what kind of API do you do? How far along do you go? How much do you make the API for? And we try to do 90% of everything needs to be easy. So it's like, how do I make something that is supposedly trivial, very important? It's supposed to be easy in the API. And you're going to see this in how we do things. 9% of the rest, sorry, 9% uh, of the total, which is 90% of the rest, is possible. So the API allows you to extend in several different ways. You're going to notice that there's a small sliver there that is not contemplated. So 1% of everything we're probably not going to support. Because, quite frankly, um, the use cases are going to be very edge cases. It's going to take too much time for us to implement this. And it's going to be hard to maintain and many other reasons. So we focus on trying to get that 99% easy or possible. The, we, in order to make things easy, we have a strong naming convention that we try to do. Uh, we do use camel case, no underscores. If you see something with underscores, it's probably a private symbol. Forget it existed. Um, and then properties are nouns, or sometimes they're adjectives and the noun is implied. 
uh, mutators and actions, and especially slots. So when you're trying to ask the object to do something, they are verbs in the imperative. So it's like lock and make and do. They are verbs in the imperative. Signals, I'm going to get into them in a little, a little while. They're verbs in the past tense. They're conveying something that happened. You don't have the opportunity to change it anymore. It has already happened. It's in the past. Um, and, of course, exceptions exist. Because we have a large API, many different people working. Um, and, of course, sometimes we try to do compatibility with what's already established. So the iterators have begin instead of beginning, right? We talk, the noun is actually the beginning, uh, the, where it starts, and begin is a verb. But we try to do that. Something that people get uh, mixed up, events and signals. Events are what you would have expected in ha event handling from early 90s. It is, I have this polymorphic type which derives from QEvent. I have my virtual function that gets called. I handle it or I don't. Events carry information. So for example, uh, a mouse move event. A mouse move event contains the coordinates of where the mouse pointer is. It contains uh, whether any button is pressed or not. So they carry information. And usually events are directed to one destination. It is, prob for example, a widget receiving a mouse move event is because the mouse pointer was on top of that widget. If I click, it's that one. If I press a key on the keyboard, then the key event is sent to the widget had focus. So like I said, it's usually from the outside world, spontaneous events. Some things are not. And they require of writing virtuals to be handled, which means that you need to create your own classes to do that. Now, events are not used very often. They are the foundation of how things work. This is why it's called the event loop. So almost everything inside Qt is carried by an event, but you don't see it. Because we have an abstraction layer on top of that, which especially includes the signals. The signals are member functions. There's a reason for that. You can read on my blog why their signals are not, um, and why they're not members, variables. There's a reason for that. And they usually indicate state changes, like I said, something that happened in the past. Signals are not directed. So th signal is something that happened. If anybody is interested in knowing that it happened, you subscribe to it. We call that connect connect to a signal. If you're not interested, if nobody's interested, the signal is, is emitted, it is there, but it simply causes no runtime uh, extra effort. Yes? How is that <coughs> model different from events? In events, you have also a publish subscribe mechanism, but from virtual functions. In, in this case... So the question is how this is done. I'll get into that. Right, I have some code examples. If I don't answer it in two or three slides, raise your hand again, and uh, I'll try to get to it. Right? Now, a signal does not require overriding a virtual in order to handle it. You just connect an existing signal to a function. This function is called a slot. Up until Qt5, a slot it was a special member function in your class. Starting with Qt5, we can do more. And I'm using that here in these examples I'm going to show. I'm connecting to lambdas. I'm connecting to uh, static functions. So you're going to see how this works. So signals and slots. And let me see if I'm answering your question here. They are the main communication mechanism in Qt. It allows M to N connections. So I can connect one signal to multiple slots. And I can connect to the same slot multiple signals. Why would I want to do that? So let me give you an example. Um, I want to be notified whether any a button in my uh, dialogue has been clicked. I don't care which one it was, for whatever reason. 
So I connect to all of them into my same slot. And the other way around, I can have one signal, for example, a clicked button, perform multiple actions. I can have one of them be dismiss the dialog because it was the OK signal. And I can have another that deletes the dialog afterwards. Um, yes? more smart, meaning that if you happen to subscribe multiple times from the same place, then you, you, know, you, will, be, you will get called back five times. So the question is, how is this implemented in the back? It is implemented as a list. It's more complex than that, the data structure, that it's slightly, it's faster. It's a list. So every signal has a list of receivers. And if you connect multiple times, you get it multiple times. You can pass a flag during connection saying unique connection. So if it's already connected, don't connect again. If it's not, then connect. This which I'm showing here is the old style um, since Qt 0.02 connection mechanism. It still works and will probably work I don't know until when. So you connect a signal to a slot. You specify the sender object, the receiver object, the, s the signal which is being emitted, and what is being received. And you can, of course, also connect signal to signal. So you can emit one signal, and as a response, another one gets emitted. Uh, these, which I'm showing here, are actually copied from the Qt source code. So they're existing examples. Um, if you, so in let's say you have a So can you inspect an existing application for its signal and slot connections that are active? Right. Uh, yes. There is an application from, uh, it's called Gamma Ray, uh, which allows you to look inside in the application. Most activities that Gamma Ray does, does not require recompiling the application. So if you take an existing application compiled by somebody else and you don't even have the source code, you can still inspect some of it. There are few activities that it does, not because it does a lot more than just signal and slot inspection, that require um, LD preload tricks, for example. So loading an extra library. So what it will do is that it actually hijacks every single connect and puts it into its own list. Um, we used to have, way back in the day, a main uh, big application list that's, of course, um, scanning issue. So it's kept now per object. There's no way, unless you know where, where the objects are, to find out where they are. So, but the tool exists and will allow you to see this connects to that. I can see my state machines. I can see all my widgets, what has focus, tabbing order. Uh, I do have it on my laptop. If you want to see it, we can talk about it later. Is that just using string matching? Uh, so the question is, how does this one work? This one requires string matching. So it requires that the parameters that you see here are exactly the ones that you see there, string-wise. Unfortunately, that means if you've got a type def of the same type, it will not match. This one. I'm going to show you. This is the only slide I will show with the old style connect. The new style connect does not do string <coughs> matching. <coughs> It's actually more modern. It's using variadic templates. And what it does is that at compile time, it creates a small sh glue function that does the calling for you. So not only does it support type defs, it will support type promotion. So if you've got a short on a signal and you're connecting to an int, it will connect. Does this answer the question? Yeah, yeah. And so does that mean that gamma ray would not work with the newer syntax? The question is, does gamma ray work with the new syntax? That's a very good question. I actually do not know. You can get the name of the signal, but once you're connecting to a lambda, the lambda is an abstract entity. 
Right? So you would see that there's a signal, it's connected to something, but you don't know what that is. Right? And so how do you emit the signal? Oh, yes, the new syntax. Sorry, there was a, uh, an animation. Uh, the new syntax is very similar, but now I'm using pointer to member functions. Right? Um, and I connect it to an empty lambda, the about to quit signal, just to show that it works. Now, how do you emit the signal? The emit the signal is simply call the function. We define this emit macro. It expands to nothing. So you can put anywhere you want. What we do is that we put it there so that we know this is a place where I'm emitting the signal. This is where I'm telling the world that something happened. There are a few consequences of that. Sometimes, for example, users delete your object when you emit. So you should be careful. After emitting, my object might no longer exist. You might have to be careful about that. Um, you never implement the body of the signal function. That's why we have uh, the meta object compiler, mock. It scans your header, sees that you define the signal, and it will define that body for you. It's a very simple function. If you ever want to see what it does, just look at the source code, see what the output of mock is. The signal is a two-line function. It takes all the parameters that you said, that you passed, puts in uh, an array of void star, and calls activate with a signal ID. That's it. It's just so that you don't have to write this boilerplate. Mock does it for you. Now, there was a question about, um, I'm not showing the unique connection here. So there's an extra parameter that you can pass, which specifies the connection type. Um, there are three types, mainly, direct, queued, and blocking queued connection type. Um, for right now, before I go into threads, I'm only talking about the direct connection type, which is when you call the signal function, when you emit the signal, the slots that are connected to it are called one by one in sequential order, and b they all finish before your signal finishes. So they're synchronous. They're called on the same thread. The other ones are slightly different. Uh, one point I want to make is that there's the auto connection, which is the default, which is choose at emission time whether it will be direct or queued. But I'll get into that when I, once I talk about threads. From the point of emission, can you override? Can you override which one it is at the point of emission? Uh, no, that is not a feature we have. Sounds interesting, though. Um, Maybe something to be explored. In general, um, you don't make that kind of decision because you want to have loose, loose coupling between signals and the receivers. From the point of view of the signal emitter, I'm simply telling the world that something happened. I don't care how you handle it. Usually, the person who makes a decision of how I want it connected is the person who made the connection. Because I have requirements that this needs to be handled afterwards in via the v event loop, or the other way around, when threads I, I get into threads, I want it to be in the same thread. I understood that from the other perspective of those. Like, as I'm making these series of calls, I want to guarantee that nobody spends too much time on it. So if you want to really do this, I'm not sure exactly how to do what you're asking for. But if you want to ensure that... In old Win32, is simply post-passage. You know. Yes. So if you're saying that this, how could you do something similar to post-message from Win32? There is a way to force a queued emission. Um, I didn't get into this into in, in here. There is a way. Um, once I talk about timers, I'll get into that. Let me. Re I'll see if I can remember it. There's another way as well, but there's. We can do something about it. Anything else before I move on to the event loop itself? I'll take that as a no. 
So the event loop. Event loop has a lot of classes. Um, abstract event dispatcher, it's the core of the event loop. You're never going to use it. Unless you're porting to a new operating system, or you're trying to do something weird like integrate Qt with MFC. So most of the time you're never going to see this class, but it is actually what is driving the event loop. Or, like its name says, it's an abstract class. It doesn't do anything. It's actually the derived classes from it that do. There is event loop itself, which is I want to control my event loop. Um, the Q application, core application, Q GUI application classes are a way to the event loop. So they have similar methods as uh, Q event loop itself. Then we have, uh, I'm going to skip to thread, same thing. It acts has an interface to the event loop besides starting a thread. And we have what exactly drives an event loop. What is the event loop composed of? Timers so and other notifiers. On a Unix world, you're going to see timers and sockets, or basically anything that is a file descriptor. On Windows, there are a couple more. Microsoft API added more types that you can uh, listen for. So what does an event loop do, do? As its name says, it's an event, it's a loop. So while I'm not being interrupted, if I'm not interrupted yet, check if there are new events and dispatch them. Once I'm done dispatching, once I'm out of the queue, I don't have anything more to do, I wait for more events. So if you're familiar with the Win32 API, um, wait for single object, wait for multiple objects. That's waiting for. Right, this is the core of the event loop on Windows. It is doing wait for. Uh, they're the core of modern applications, except for shell tools and file processing tools, said uh, cat, uh, which are driven by, the st by standard input. Everything else that I can think of is driven by an event loop. So of course, GUI applications. I need to react to the user acti uh, w interacting with my application. But also, if you t think of uh, daemons and servers, uh, an Apache web server, the only thing it is doing is it's a loop. If there's a connection, handle the connection, do something with it, and then I'm done, move on to the next one. Uh, of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. It tries to scale, distribute to multiple processes. But the core of it is the same. The feature of a view of what we have, uh, quite a lot of stuff. So we receive events from, mul from multiple GUI um, frameworks, um, Mac, Windows, multiple on Linux. Uh, so many others, uh, we, we, for example, integrate with DirectFB, we integrate with Wayland, we integrate with X11. Um, what was it that one called? OpenWF. Um, so there are several of them. It manages the event queue itself, which is actually a priority queue. So it's not just a queue, it's actually a priority queue, even though nobody uses the priorities. The feature is there, and it's optimized for single priority. But if you want to increase the priority of an event, you can. Um, there's a feature of event filtering, which is that I want to intercept an event before it gets delivered, and maybe hijack it. Some people abuse event filtering as event handling without having to derive and override a virtual. Quite frankly, I do not recommend you do that. Event filters are evil. Um, it integrates with basically three types of, four types of uh, event loops. Uh, generic Unix, which is doing select. We have an integration with glib. Um, the C library from the GNOME project, uh, Mac and Windows UI event loops themselves. Of course, we do timers, sockets, Windows events, thread safe, waking up, uh, probably more, a lot more things that I just can't think of right now. So for example, one of them is um, live lock prevention. What happens if you post an event while handling an event? Right? Will the event loop continue handling that? Or will it go back and sleep for a while and let other things coming in? 
uh, we have a live lock prevention mechanism. Uh, what, why didn't you support ePoll? So well, the question is, why don't you support ePoll? ePoll is a very powerful tool for high um, availability servers and things handling up to th thousands or more of file descriptors. Most Qt applications do not get anywhere near that. They are mostly dealing with um, tens of file descriptors at most. The other thing is that ePoll, in order to add a socket, you need to make a system call. And several classes in Qt, including user code, add and remove sockets all the time. They keep activating and deactivating it. So we want to avoid the system call overhead unless we have to. So benchmarking done by friends of mine show that ePoll starts to be worth it once your uh, file descriptor count increases. Most Qt applications, UI applications, don't get there. It's possible to create an a dispatcher that does ePoll, just that nobody has done it. We just haven't felt the need. And is this select or p-select? Is this select or p-select? Uh, up until 5.0 was select, in 5.1 is p-select, because unrelated change completely, I started using nanoseconds. So I just changed every time vault to time spec, and hey, there's p-select. And of course, that broke the build on Qnix, because even though they advertise POSIX 2001 support, the function is missing. So we had to add the workaround. So what does the abstract dispatcher look like? And this is the only time you're going to see it, probably ever in your lives. Um, process the events that you have. Check if you have pending events. Register socket. Register timer. In the specific case of Windows, register a Windows event notifier and wake up and interrupt. So what the difference between these two are, wake up is when another thread wants to wake up this thread. It simply calls this function, which is supposed to be thread safe, and tells, you probably have an event, which I added to your queue. Now, wake up and handle it. Whereas interrupt is, besides waking up if you're sleeping, uh, you've been interrupted. So I actually want you to exit to your caller. So do not handle more events. Once you're done with this cycle, return. Fairly simple. Uh, there are a couple more functions, convenience functions in there, but this is the core of the dispatcher. And like I said, you're only going to see this if you're porting to a new OS or trying to integrate with a third-party event loop. Or if you're like you, you want to implement ePoll. Then you're going to take this one or probably just take the Unix one and modify it. So I'm going to go now a little about the data sources. Timer, we provide millisecond-based timing. So even though we're using time spec internally, we do not provide an API for nanoseconds. Most GUI applications do not require it. And even then, it's because we cannot give you the real-time guarantees. If your, if your application or your thread requires real-time guarantees, you're probably going to do something besides skewed. So that's the 1% that I said that we don't always handle. That's probably one of those cases. Queue timer provides one signal which you can connect to, timeout, saying timer expired. Now let me do something. Um, answering your question from before, if you create a timer with a timeout of zero and connect its timeout to your signal again, so signal to signal connection. Once you do that, that means your signal will be emitted on the next event loop. And single shot timers are so used that QTimer has this uh, static function called QTimer single shot, which for which you just give the timeout and your receiver. So what you would do in your case, uh, the question that you asked about how can I forcibly queue my, my signal, uh, 
what, I, what you would do is Q timer single shot zero and then this signal your signal name there's another method to do that, which is an invoke method. Slightly more complicated, I can show you later. But most people who require emitting a signal back in the event loop again will do a single shot timer. Many reasons to do that, including, for example, what I said before, which is sometimes your user deletes your object when you emit. If you cannot handle that, emitting it to the next event loop iteration is a good idea. Another example I can give is from Dbus, which is that I process many of the incoming messages from the Dbus library, which is not re-entrant. So if I emit the signal from inside my processing, the user might re-enter back into it and cause a deadlock. I can't have that. So what I do is that I decouple the processing at one point in time, and then it goes, it leaves the dbus library. It's no longer inside their code. I'm inside the queued event loop and then I can do this because I know that if the user tries to do something there will not be a re-entrance. Did this answer your question? Good. Uh, this is a new feature I wrote for Qt 4.8 but ended up only 5.0 which is the coarseness. Um, I was trying to look for a graphic that proved the point and I couldn't find it. But talking to my colleagues at Intel, um, have you ever heard of the term race to sleep? Given your faces, I guess no. Race to sleep is like this. And I'm, I'm on battery power. The processor being on consumes power. So what I want to do is make sure that I, the processor is active for the least amount of time possible. And another interesting property is that between the lowest power level and the highest power level, the increase is not that much. Whereas the decrease between the lowest power level and nothing, processor sleeping, is a great deal. So what I want to do is make sure I do the most once the processor is woken up. If the processor is active, let's do it. And then sleep again. This is race to sleep. So we provide the default now for timers are coarse. So QTimer will introduce up to 5% error every time it wakes up so that your timer wakes up at a specific barrier in time. So for example, if I ask for a 100 millisecond timer and the time now is ending at 133 milliseconds, it will introduce an error so that it ends at always 100, 200, 300. Why am I doing that is that so if there are more timers in your application, they all wake up at the same time. I want to make sure that I don't sleep for half a millisecond, one or two milliseconds, just because when you created the timers, there was processing involved. So introduce the coarseness. Now, if you do require millisecond precision, you can ask for it. And the very coarse one is just rounded to the nearest second. So things like I'm connecting uh, 10 sockets, all of them have a timeout of 30 seconds. I don't care if it's half a second early or late, just give me the closest. And it will up and down. So 5% error is an interesting number because it means that anything below 20 milliseconds, the error is one millisecond. So it's equivalent to precise. And why I did that? It's because the guys doing graphics want 60 millisecond wake-ups. 60 hertz, 60 frames per second. Whereas if I'm above 20 seconds, which is the networking time, I can actually go by to the second already. Any questions here? If the, um, if the timer, if the timer object is deleted before the timer is called, hmm. then the time's not called, is that right? if the queue object, the queue timer object is deleted. So something you should know about all queue objects. If you delete the object before the signal is emitted, the slot is not called. Same thing happens with the timers. So that, that will never get called? Um, this example, will it be called? That depends on what's coming up yeah, after here, right? Depends on whether you start the event loop before this object runs out of scope. But that's a very good question, right? 
So here's an example, thank you also for pointing it out. We have uh, a signal being connected to a lambda. Just showing that. Um, this example is actually coming from source code I wrote that I'm going to use throughout this presentation. So I'm pretty sure this one actually does not expire because what comes after it is queue application exec and then return from the main function. The next important one, data source, is socket notification. If you're on Windows, it is socket. Do not try to use it for anything but sockets. If you're on Unix, you use it for everything as well if you want. So anything that's a file descriptor can be selected on, can be done with that one. Um, and just like uh, timer, it has one signal which is activated. Uh, the parameter there, the int, is just something to help you. It is the file descriptor that was activated. So if you're connecting the same, uh, the, the same slot has several different uh, sender signals connected to it, you can determine which one it was by that parameter. And here, again from the same example, I'm showing what the pipe, the, this object is doing. So I'm on Unix. I didn't want to do sockets because I have classes for sockets. That's the last part of my presentation today. I wanted to read from a pipe. Um, I actually cheated. This works also on standard input. So I called it pipe reader, but it works on reading from standard input. And this is the example I'm using throughout the presentation. So this parameter is going to be zero. It's going to be standard input. Yes? How does this uh, uh, socket notifier, how does this compare to the ready read signal for a QTCP socket, for example? So how does the socket notifier compare to the socket's ready read? Uh, one triggers the other. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, with the buffering. So I'll get into that in the last part of the presentation. So what any class dealing with pipes or sockets or anything will do is create one socket notifier for each one. So um, QTCP socket will have one socket notifier for reading and one for writing. QProcess will have one for standard input, one for standard output, and one for standard error. So there are three of them. And then they connect the activated to a function that will do something. So in this one, what it is doing is that it's going to be reading from the file descriptor. Uh, when I show the function, I think I do have it here. It's similar to what QProcess and QTCP socket do, except that those, instead of my example, my example does it reads and emits the data. Those, what they do is that they read, put in a buffer, and then let you know that it's been buffered. So looking at the source code of the event loop, what it does is that um, I'm just using here a simplified version. Take all of the socket notifiers that I have enabled, read, write an exception. Nobody uses exception, but they're there, just in case somebody does. Select, which means blocking, if there is a timeout, right, or not. And then once I'm awake again, just send everything that was posted in between. So posted events from other threads, for example, and I've been woken up. So if I'm woken up, I'm going to exit that. Dispatch all the file descriptors and dispatch all the expired timers. This is the core of the event loop on Unix. Very simple. Of course, if you're going to tell me, like, should be using select, should use Paul, should use pselect. Yes, I know. This is just an example. OK, so far. Now we go to Windows. Windows has the win event notifier. Because not everything on Windows can be selected with QSocket notifier. QSocket notifier only works with WinSock, with sockets. If you're using uh, win event notifier, you can listen to other things. For example, I try to do pipes. And it actually does emit. So the only problem is that it keeps emitting. It, even though there's nothing to be read, it keeps emitting. So I'm doing something wrong there. Apparently, I need to use a third thing called completion ports, and I didn't have time to investigate. But the API is very, very similar to socket notifier. It has a, func uh, a, a, sl a signal called activated, just like uh, 
token notifier and passes the handle for you. Now I've shown you what the data sources are for an event loop. Well, the sync of that source are objects. Right? So they're all signals. I consume them in a slot. And like I've been saying, this is started with Qt5. They can be connected to uh, lambdas and non-member functions, functors, etc. Um, just showing one example here uh, of that that um, of that uh, source code I was talking about. I have slots, public, uh, public or private. That is something I, I define for my own myself. And for example, the closed channel socket, which is when um, I want to do something, it just closes and emits a signal in return. I'll Could you briefly talk about how the emit syntax works? How the emit syntax works? Um, emit, this thing here, expands to nothing. So I'm simply making a function call. That function is the function whose body was implemented by mock, so you don't have to write it. And what it does is that each signal, when mock is processing your <coughs> header, this guy here, it will assign each signal an ID, an integer. So that function basically says this signal with this ID was emitted, and here were the parameters. That's all it does. And then internally what it will do is that, well, I have this ID, let me look up the list of what's connected to it, and call each one. It's simply a dispatcher function. So, I mean, why do you have the emit so why do I have the keyword? It is just for aesthetic reasons. Just to let me know that uh, this is a signal I'm emitting. I don't have and should not look for the source code to see what it's doing. It's a signal emission. I don't know why they created it in the beginning, if they intended it as a, a language extension, but it's been there since Qt 0. Point whatever. And it's been there forever, so it's just kept. If you suppress it, if you don't include it, nothing changes. Now, the event loop, uh, the main event loop is the Q core application class. Uh, each application has one instance of it, and there are two derived classes that you can, you should use if you have uh, more specialized needs, if you have Q windows or Q widgets. The thread in which the Q core application was created defines as what uh, the, the GUI thread is, the main thread. Um, that's because that's the thread in which the UI system will connect to the UI server and get events from. Most of these UI server systems, and especially for example LibX11, they're not thread safe. So they can only be used from one thread. And this still remains today in Qt's code. <coughs> All of the widget classes and everything else is completely non-thread safe. They can only be used from one thread. So I looked up for a very simple example of what a main function does. And this is what it does. Right? So this is one of the examples in Qt5. It's using, this is a Q window. That's that analog clock window. I'm not going to go into the GUI details. That's not my area of expertise. But the main function, what it does, is that it creates the application, which creates the event loop, connects to the UI server, creates what I need to do, and does exec. That's it. Through some magic, when I close this window, uh, there's some magic in Qt called quit on last window closed. So if the last window is closed, it automatically exits the event loop. And the main function returns, and your application exits. So exact blocks? So the question is, does exact block? Yes, it does. Because if it didn't, you would return from main, the application would exit. I thought you were supposed to return app.exec. You're supposed to return app.exec. Yes, you, you might want to, or you might not. That depends on what you want to do. Um, usually, people do that. They return the value that exec returns. Because that would allow you to say somewhere else in the application, and I showed you an example uh, right here. That was there. So if you do this and call exit with a value, that value is returned from exec, and that will allow you to return that value 
to the application that calls it. So exec blocks, and it returns the value with which the event loop was interrupted. So it's almost complete except for the last return. It's so in yes, you would at the very last thing you do, exec. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah I was wondering because you said earlier it's a complete example. I was looking for the return. Uh, uh, yes, this is a complete example. You were asking if this is a complete example. Yes, this is exactly taken from the example. Of course, I'm not showing you the, the, the function here, the, this class. And since this is a GUI application, I do not expect it to have any return values. It's not processing anything, and you really do not need to know if it failed or succeeded. So in this case, um, Z++ standard says if you don't return anything from main, it returns zero. It's a special function. Right? The compiler will not even complain if you forgot to return a value from main. If it were any other function, it would complain and say you didn't return anything. So I think I have more examples where I do return something after executing. Yeah, void main is... Um, so this is the example I was doing. Uh, I was just doing a reading from a pipe. And just to prove two things at the same time, I was doing timed reading from a pipe. So very useless application, it just, if you launch it, it waits for two seconds. If you write anything in those two seconds, it will say, I've read something. If it doesn't, it will say, timeout. So very useless, but just showing what it does. I will share with the source code with you later. This is my class, it's the pipe reader. It has a couple of signals, which is data received, which includes like the ready read. It includes the data that I received. So naming convention, this is a verb in the past saying data received, data was received, and I'm included, including what happened. The channel was closed. That means when I'm reading from a pipe and I realize, oh, this pipe has closed, I emit the signal channel was closed. So in the case of the receiver, it gets to define how that connection is, and it ends up being queued, passing that as a reference is going to be problematic. It's a very good question. You're pointing out that this signal here is passing by reference. What happens if I queue it, which means that my signal function has returned? Right, the temper is gone. How can the, the receiver work? Uh, magic? No, what happens is that Qt copies the data. So every constant reference <coughs> parameter is treated as passing by value. It simply copies it onto the event that is posted to the other thread or to the event loop. So when the receiver is called, it has a fresh copy. Did this answer the question? Yes. Now, if you didn't put const, it will tell you, I cannot queue and reference. I do not know how to queue a reference. If you had passed the pointer, it would copy the pointer. And it's up to you to guarantee that it's still valid. <coughs> but a reference, I don't know how to copy a reference. But that means uh, uh, data passed be, must be copyable. That means the data passed must be copyable. Yes, that's exactly what it means. So what can you do if your data, the parameter there, isn't copyable? Um, movable does not make sense for signals because you might be calling more than one. Might have more than one slot called. Which means that if you move out of the first one onto the second, um, what's the state of the moved from object. Um, maybe I want to signal this one shot, only use one time. So in some cases, can you want that? I think that you might want it, but we have not implemented moving. It's because we did not design for it. Now, um, if you 
use something which is not copyable or movable at all, the signal will emit, but you cannot queue it because it can't be copied. So, so in, in case of a sy synchronous delivery, there is no copying involved? In this case of synchronous delivery, is there copying involved? Synchronous. Mm -hmm. No, there is no copying involved. In this case, couldn't you use like, something uh, like a shared pointer? Could you use a shared pointer to keep, for example, a pointer alive or pass something that is not a reference copyable? Yes, you could. And then the shared pointer is copied, right? I, I don't care how the shared pointer is doing, what it's doing internally, just like the case of the pointer. I don't care if, how you guarantee that it is valid. I'm copying what you give me. Are you, you're copying it onto the queue, but uh, it's not going to be copied if there's in slots it's connected to. It won't be copied in times, it'll only be copied one time, right? Uh, how many times will it be copied if I have multiple connections, queued connections? I need to check the source code. It might be copied several times, once per event. It definitely needs to be copied once per destination thread. Right. We'll get into threads in a second. Um, so just a simple example, the main function, what it does is creates the pipe reader. It will connect the channel close to application exit. So the, the example I was going to give, if this is a command line processing tool. Right. So when standard in closes, my application closes. If I've got data, I'm just going to say received number of bytes. Uh, just a simple, stupid application. And I have the timer. So this is exactly the example you saw before. Uh, I took this code from it. And timer start and exec. So here's the example where we have the return with the exec because I might want to return a number one. So this is a command line tool. If it times out, it will return one, which is an error, to the calling shell. Going a little further, so what does the event loop class, what do I need it for if everything I've done so far doesn't use event loop? Now event loop is for nesting event loops. So I'm in or, and I have another example showing it. But usually for a nesting event loop. So I'm called out of some requirement, out of a signal, handling something else. Now I need to do something that requires event loop again before I return. So I use Q event loop to start an event loop again without freezing the UI. But I tell you, avoid it if you can. Because it creates a number of problems that Things might re-enter, uh, new activations of sockets or timers that you were not expecting. So avoid it if you can. Um, the examples I'm showing you are not avoiding that. Just to show what can be done, but there are alternatives to what I'm doing. So trying to use the pipe reader with the event loop, I wrote, it, I, I wrote this small function called nested event loop, which does exactly what the other one did, but I'm using an event loop. I'm not using the core application. I'm using loop exec. Why is that? Well, in this case, because I want to return the data that was read inside. So I connected the data received onto a Lambda that takes data by reference. I hope you guys are familiar with the Lambda non this non the stateful lambda syntax. And I assigned in that lambda to this data here, and I'm returning it there. So I just create the event loop, exec it. By the time it returns, you see there the event loop quit when the channel closes. So I return the data that was read. This one is not using a timer, so if I run this function, it will read up until end of file from standard input. Yes, Jeff? With this connection, um, the, the mock is not involved, right? Is mock involved in this connection? Connections do not involve mock at all. Oh. The connection itself. What is required is identity of the signal. So what this does... Um, I'm going to very much simplify it to you. You can show the code later. 
it asks the meta object what is the ID of the signal. Because once the signal is called, I need to match the ID, which is a simple integer. Okay. So, so the signal is still processed through the mock, the traditional way, and the, the meta uh, meta object. is present. Yeah, so what you said is the signal still requires mock activity. The slots don't. So you can connect to anything now. You do not need, if you're not creating new signals, you're not going to see mock. Mock is not going to run in your application. So if anybody wants to say, uh, Qt is not C++, I have to run mock, I don't want to run mock, yes, you now don't have no need to. You can just connect to anything you want, as long as you do not create new signals. And you don't. If you're just using Qt API, you don't. Now, exec appears in a couple of other classes too. Um, especially dialogues. Why? Because in a dialogue, the, usual, the original intent was I'm showing this and I want it to be done by the time I return. That's the case of the progress dialogue, which I have an example for. File dialogues are like that. Um, and anything that is a pop-up, actually. So Q menu has the same thing. I don't want to go into GUI. And like I said, avoid it if you can. All of these classes have a show method, and then you just show it, return to the event loop, make sure it doesn't go out of scope, right? And then once it's done, it will emit the signals, you process it. So how does the pipe reader work with the progress dialog? Um, so in this case, what I'm doing is I create the progress the dialog. I'm expecting 100 bytes, just to make the example simple. So it shows a progress bar from 0 to 100 percent, which is 100. And then it creates the file reader. And every time the data received signal is emitted, I will set the value of the progress dialog to the current value plus what I've got. The Q min is there for that. If, if I type two characters at the end, when it's 99, go to 101, it would overflow and wouldn't do anything. Why? Keep progress dialog has an interesting feature, which is that as soon as you hit 100%, the dialog closes and you return. So I don't have to do anything with the channel closed as soon as I get 100%. So if the channel closes, I accept, I'm done. Great. So if I run to end of file with 50 bytes, it closes. If I go to 101 characters, it returns the first 100. And if I click stop reading on that dialog, the result will not be accepted, so I'll return an error. So far, so good? I'm running a little of time, so I want to go into threading. Uh, the networking part is quite simple. So um, Qthread, like I said, it has an interface to the event loop, but it also manages a new thread. And let me be clear, it manages a thread. It is not the thread. So lots of people get this wrong. Um, I'm not going to go into much details of that. But it does provide a few things for the current thread. Sleeping and yielding, basically. So if I want my thread to yield processing, there's a function for that. If I want to sleep, I'm probably wrong. I probably do not want to sleep, and my idea is wrong. So what is managing? Managing is starting a thread, waiting for the thread to be uh, over, forcing it to exit, or asking nicely that it exits, uh, being notified that it exits via signal. That is managing a thread. The thread itself is elsewhere. Now, um, let me just go into a little why you need threads. Well, there are very good reasons why you need threads. Uh, Calling block blocking functions. So if you have an API that you need to call and it blocks, you do not want to freeze your UI, move it to a separate thread, and then you're done. Uh, if you need to do CPU intensive work, by all means, move it out to another thread. Let the main loop, the GUI thread, work nicely with what it needs to do. If you need to do real time work, like I said before, probably use a thread. If you need to do scalability, uh, multiple processing to use more cores on my CPU. Uh, you can think of a couple more, like I have this code flow which is too hard to do by breaking it up, 
Yes, put it on a thread. Now, bad reasons for it, like I said, sleep. I can probably refute any reason you give me that you think that you need sleep. Most of the times you can do with a Q timer, so you do not need to sleep, and therefore don't need a thread. Um, sometimes people say, I have this specialized hardware that has specific time constraints, I need to sleep. Yeah, but in this case, you're actually doing real time work. If you're trying to sleep on a regular Q thread, I cannot guarantee how long it will have slept for. So I cannot guarantee the timing either. And the other thing is networking and I.O. If you're using QTCP socket, you do not need threads. I'll get into that in the last part of the presentation. So what does a typical thread look like if it's not doing event loop? Um, this one still <coughs> requires uh, overriding a virtual, and you put your code there. We do have plans to add new API, which is nicer, uh, based on what standard threads is doing. Uh, we want to return futures. This is API in research we haven't finished yet, so it's not even in 5.1. What you have in 5.1 is this. You override run, your code runs there. So if I want to put there my code that reads from a pipe in my thread, um, this is not using my pipe reader class. It's just doing read, so POSIX read. If it's not an error, add to the buffer and emit it. All right, if it is an error, or if it's an end of file, return from run, the thread exits. So for example, what I can do in dealing with this thread is, as soon as the thread exits, I know that the pipe is closed, my processing is done. An interesting thing that Qt does, and this is where the Qt connection comes in, so I'm going to talk about the Qt connection in a minute, is that each object is associated with a thread. By default, is the thread in which it was created, but you can move to it. What is this association? What does the association mean? It is that it's where the events and slots will be called. So if I post an event to an object, the thread which will handle that event is the thread in which the object is associated with which the object is associated. It's also the thread in which it must be deleted. For the specific case of QTimer and QSocket notifier, if you try to delete them in the wrong thread, they will access the wrong event dispatcher or try to access the right one without a lock, and that will do nasty things. And so if you go on top of that with more higher level classes, like TCP socket, it's going to corrupt even more. So Q objects basically do not touch them outside of their own thread unless the function is specifically marked as thread safe. So how do you move an object to a thread? So this is the threaded pipe reader. Uh, you saw the, the, the run function a, a little while ago. So what it does is that it creates a new pipe reader. It moves the pipe reader to the new thread so that it also moves the socket notifier. And then I connect a few things, which at the end I will do, delete the reader and quit my uh, thread zone event loop. So is that just basically setting the thread ID on the object? That way we will access the right event loop? So it, how is this setting the thread ID in the object? Yes, so when you move an object to a thread, and then you later ask, what is your thread? So object, Q object thread, it will return that thread. It is the thread in which the events will be uh, handled. I've seen a lot of code where the move to thread is in the constructor of whatever, um, like the object that you want to run in a separate thread. So you would see something like pipe reader, um, maybe inheriting from Q thread, and then you would say move thread to this. So you're asking 
Which is, one it, is it? <coughs> which one is it preferred? The way I've done here, which I move an object, or in the case where the object moves itself? I would say that both have their use cases. When you move an object in its own constructor, it's usually because that object is managing a thread elsewhere. So it also starts the thread and manages that. Or it's a very specific case of one instance object. In this case here, this is the same pipe reader that I used 10 slides ago. So it doesn't know anything about threads. It simply works in any thread. So I simply moved it into the thread I created and it automatically moves the, th the children. So I moved the reader, the reader moves the socket notifier. So I know that that event loop will be pulling the, the, this file script there. Yes, Jens? But, um, you shouldn't move the class derived from QThread into... Thank you. Yes, you should not do that. You're telling me that you should not move a, Q th a class derived from QThread to itself. And yes, you should not do that. That's not what I'm doing here. Right. So if I removed here the reader and said, move to thread this, this is wrong. Doing like I did here, that's OK. So let's go into the connection types again. The queued connection means that an event is posted to the thread in which the object has, was moved to and saying, now with this event, call that slot. Right? So it's asynchronous, and it's potentially run on a different thread. If you queue a connection, and the object, the destination object, is the same thread, it's just the same thread. And the blocking queued connection is the same as a queued connection, except that it includes a semaphore. So it will be synchronous. It will wait for the other thread to run the slot, the receiver function, before it returns. The necessary gotcha is that it's always run in a different thread. If you try to use blocking queued connection on the same thread, the receiver in the same thread, you're going to deadlock. You probably just want direct connection. Why did an art implement something that detects at runtime what does it do? What, which one it should be? I tried. Uh, there is a, a race condition. What happens if at the moment of emission, the object, I determine it's on another thread, but the other thread is pushing that object onto my thread. It's still a deadlock. So I cannot guarantee it will work. It just says, if you do this, make sure it's on another thread. I did notice a helpful runtime error message telling me that, uh, that I was trying to signal or something, something that was on a different thread. Is there, are there, I, I think that was what it was telling me. <coughs> Are there, are there some checks that you do perform? So the question is, I'm just going to say, the question was, um, are there checks at runtime on what things do? Yes, there are a couple of checks. For example, queuing uh, uncopyable parameters. Uh, it does try to detect a few things. So for example, it does check if it's on the same thread. Because if it's on the same thread, I know it cannot be pushed. So this is a deadlock. But if it's on a different thread and gets pushed onto my thread, I cannot guarantee anything. So there is a check on that specific case, but I cannot do the other way around. So what does a typical thread with event loop does is that if you have uh, this run function, which we had before, you might want to do some preparation, call exec, and then clean up at the end. If you don't have any preparation or cleanup, don't even implement the run function because that's what it does. The run function, the default implementation calls exec. So you don't need to do anything. Now, I have less than 15 minutes to go over the IO. So I'm probably not gonna go all the way to the end. IO classes. Uh, sorry, uh, were there any questions on threading before? 
Okay, I'll take that as a note. It's a complex topic. You probably will have questions once you play with it. The IO classes, we divide into two big groups, uh, which are the random access classes and the sequential access classes. The random access are basically QFile and what's everything is derived from QFile and QBuffer. And sequential access is basically everything else. The base class of it all is QIO device. It basically wraps around a file descriptor if you're in, on Unix. It provides the carriage return translation if you ask for it. So on t if you ask for text mode and you're running on Windows, it will add and remove as necessary the carriage return. It provides the reading and writing functions, read, write, read all, read line. It does provide the signals which the question was about ready read and bytes written. It provides buffering support. And also you can figure out if you're at the end, what the size of it. And these functions change behavior depending on whether it is random access, which means I know the size of this thing up until the end, or it's sequential. I don't know how many bytes are coming later. So just to give you an example, if this is, um, sequential access, and there are no more bytes queued, at end returns true. But there might be new bytes later. I do not know. Once the socket receives more bytes, the pipe receives more bytes, I can get this thing returning false again. But if it's a file and I reach the end, then it is the end, usually. And size is implemented the other way around. It returns the same, the number of bytes that are available if it's sequential or the full size of the file. So random access is the defining feature is that seek and size operate on uh, the same, on the full buffer. So you can seek and you can go back. You can seek to the end, you can go back and you get the same files, the same bytes again. That's random access. You can go forward and backwards as much as I want. And the device can be put into unbuffered mode. So a file, a Q file can be put in unbuffered mode. Interestingly, Q buffer can be put in unbuffered mode. Uh, that just, just changes a few things internally. And all I.O. is synchronous. So whenever I write on a file, it will try immediately to write to disk. It will buffer if necessary, but then if the buffer is full, it will immediately try to write to disk we consider that the I.O. latency of writing to a file is not blocking. It takes time, yes, if you've got NFS shares running on this other side of the planet. But that's not what we call blocking because nobody runs NFS on the other side of the planet. Usually it's disk or USBs or SSDs. Uh, those are quite fast and they're done immediately. And we don't have a notification support. So the signals are never emitted for QFile. Are you calling write directly? So are we calling write directly? Yes. So if it's unbuffered mode, it calls write directly. If it's buffered, it will write to the buffer. If the buffer is full, it writes the buffer to disk. The example of QFile is just <laughs> open standard in. This is a tricky, nice example open a file file or f so I can open a file name file descriptor or a file pointer and I can put it into the do I'm asking also to do carriage return transformation and I'm reading each line so just simple doing print how many bytes I get in each line in sequential access IO though is that you cannot skip ahead and go back you must read each byte sequentially and all functions are non blocking if you write, it will buffer and not write immediately. It does not even check if it can write immediately. It simply buffers. So for example, QTCP socket write always returns the exact number of bytes that you passed because it only buffered. It cannot fail. So all operations are buffered and by default, the buffers have unlimited size. If you're writing, you've got the size of the byte buffer. If you're asking to write, then 
it will continue doing it. If you don't want the buffer to grow beyond that certain size, stop writing. If you're re reading and the input comes from the outside world, you can set the limit of that buffer. And the signals do work. Now, if you really want to do synchronous, there are a couple of functions, the wait for functions. These are the only blocking functions in all of the I.O. code. So they operate on the buffers. What you need to do is you write and then you wait for the bytes written. And they're paired one to one with a signal. That means if I wait for it, it means I want to be you to return as soon as that signal was emitted. So just like what I said, remember that they operate on buffers. If you want to read, you must call wait for wait for ready read. If you want to make sure that your bytes were written, wait for bytes written. And the interesting thing is that both functions operate on both directions. They just wait for different signals. So that allows you to avoid a deadlock because you're trying you're waiting for your for some bytes to be written and the other side is waiting for bytes from you or the other way around. Um, since I'm really running out of time now, let's see what I can do. The idea is how do you do this? If ready read is emitted, you should read and then you write when necessary. The event loop will take care of everything. Uh, just said if you want to limit the buffer sizes, for the output buffer, simply stop writing if you don't want it to grow beyond a certain size. If you want the input buffer to be limited, set read buffer size, and then as soon as it reaches that limit, it will stop reading from the socket or from the process or from um, whatever. Interesting thing is that if, you, if your buffer reaches a limit, it stops reading, the operating system buffer will be full, it will stop doing TCP acts, it will tell the sender to stop writing. So that's a way to do rate limiting. So, ah. Just be careful, this introduces latency. So the more buffers you add, and we have one more here, the more the latency is to trigger that. So when do you use each one? If you're doing networking in the GUI thread, or if you're doing anything in the GUI thread, always use the synchronous. Do not use blocking functions in the GUI thread. It might freeze your UI. Always think that if you block, the other side is your enemy, they might wait for you <coughs> indefinitely. If you're doing multiple I.O. on the same thread, and you need both or more to be activated and handled, you need to do a synchronous. You cannot, if you block on one, the other one might not be handled. If you have a short child process, and it's not your enemy, then you can do synchronous. But remember that there is your another enemy, which is the operating system. It might not schedule your child process for another two days, and your UI is blocked. And of course, if you're writing a blocking function, you have to do the blocking ones. Um, queue process example. Um, created a queue process. I'm doing. I'm running queue make asking it for its version here. And as soon as I get the finished signal, I'm going to read. So I'm not reacting to ready read. I'm reacting to finished. Skip the first line. Tell the process to delete later. And then I emit the line I read, which is the cute version. So the second line of the QMake output is the line. This is the asynchronous. The synchronous version is similar. So again, I'm waiting for the same signal, the finished. And then skip the first line, return the second line. The only advantage is I don't need to delete because it runs, go, runs, goes out of scope. How does delete later work? How does delete later work? It's very simple. It posts an event saying delete later. So when the event loop runs again, it says, oh, delete, and the event handler says delete to this. That's it. It's very simple. And the HTTP 09 downloader example. 
if you try to do this with anything but Qt, it's going to be at least 20 or 30 lines. You can see what I'm doing here is connect to host, write, and wait for disconnected. In other words, before this line here, I did not even start the daemon resolution. It simply buffered, recorded the fact that I wanted it to disconnect. I actually didn't ask for it to disconnect. I could do disconnect from host afterwards, and it would write and disconnect. In this case, I'm waiting for the other side to disconnect. If you do this with an HTTP server, it will reply. Most of them. It's called HTTP 09. Get slash, no header. It will return the value to me, the, the home page, and disconnect at the end. So I'm returning one page. Have you ever wondered why HTTP 09 is like this? Have you ever seen Gopher? It's exactly the same, except it's missing the get command. So you give it a path and wait for it to disconnect. That's Gopher. Nobody uses Gopher anymore. I had to look up how this thing works before writing the presentation. I'm out of time. Um, just going to say that if you want to do networking, you're probably not going to do this thing. There's Qt Network Access Manager. That does it a lot nicer for you. There's QTCP socket only if you need to do specific protocols. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here until Thursday. I have two more presentations. You can always talk to me. I'll be happy to answer more questions you have. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you have a break now. It's lunch. Sorry, I'm holding you guys for lunch, so I'm not going to hold you guys anymore. We can talk over lunch if anybody wants to. Thank you for coming. <laughs>